This is my desire. The title of my message this morning is What My Heart Desires. Wow. <laughs> All right, keep, go to the next one. Okay, next, next one. I give you my heart, I give you my soul. There's a kind of a, a spot in the message that connects and speaks to that. So anyway, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go off, off the path so quickly, but I wanted to make the point that, you know, the Lord, at least maybe I don't have to share that with y'all every time, but the Lord always, for some reason, he does that for me. He verifies to me. Now, whether or not you like the message is another story, <laughs> but at least I know that I heard the Lord on where we were supposed to go this morning. Amen. All right. So we titled this morning's message, or I did, What My Heart Desires, and we're going to go to Amos chapter 8, and we're just going to read uh, two verses out of there. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Amos 8. Here we go. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north, even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. I put in here they would desire it, but they couldn't find it. And that's what I wanted to talk to you this morning about, about the desires of the heart. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 real quick. These are the words of the Lord in the first gospel. And he says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt but, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so the, Lord, the thought that the Lord gave me had to do with desires of the heart, but not so much like where Jesus is even talking about right here for us not to be consumed and overwhelmed with the desires or the treasures that the earth offers. And so many times whenever we talk about that, we get in our mindset that, you know, things having to do with money, things having to do with uh, physical or material uh, desires. And, you know, the Lord says all those things are going to fade away. But it's not so much that I'm wanting to look at it from a negative perspective. I mean, ultimately, I guess the message in some way speaks to us and, and warns us that there can be a negative aspect to this. But it's really more about like, what is the desires of your heart? Not even so much, are you desiring things of the world? Because many times we find ourselves, every last one of us has found ourselves desiring something, focused on attaining something, right, that the world has to offer. But more than that, the question that I'm really asking this morning, because I, I hope my message communicates it to you, but the, mess, the, the question that I'm really asking this morning is this, do you desire the things of God? That's right. Do you desire what God offers? Do you desire His Word? Do you desire His ways? Do you desire His will? Or is the world still drawing you and giving you a desire towards it? Hearts that have a desire for God and the things of God. So often people really that have prayed to God, really they've prayed, they've asked God to change them and to be a part of their lives. They still find themselves struggling, right? They still find themselves struggling with the world and the things that the world offers. And, and I don't know about you, but for a long time in my own personal life, for many years as a Christian, I would ask God to bless me and ask God to direct me. But I didn't really have a hunger to please him. I mean, somewhere deep down in my heart, there was a desire for that or else I would have never even asked. But it really wasn't the focal point of what was driving me, you know, and I, and I would ask God, you know, direct, direct me. And, and, and I would want God's direction, but I wasn't really hungry or desiring to seek him or his word. And for me personally, this resulted in many years of frustration, you know. Whenever, once you've given your heart to the Lord, if the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, once that happens, I mean, because that's what the Bible teaches, that when you get saved, that's the big transition point, right? Whenever we talk about salvation and being born again, that is really, 
for lack of better words, where the rubber meets the road. When you truly get converted, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. And that's what makes you different than everyone around you. Many times we can get self-righteous and we can begin to think and look down on other people. But really and truly, that should never happen because the spirit of God is the spirit of Jesus. And the spirit of Jesus is very humble and selfless, right? And, and so when that spirit comes to live in us, it shouldn't cause us to rise up with self-righteousness. Although that does tend to happen to all of us at some point in time. But, but in reality, the love of God comes to, comes to live on the inside. And that's really what changes us. But at the same time, there's this war sometimes that takes place where the world is drawing us and trying to keep us uh, from really selling out and giving everything to God, right? And for me personally, there was many years that ended with great tragedy. And I've told my story before about how great tragedy struck my life. And, and it, it, it brought me to a moment, a place uh, of pain and sorrow. And in that place of pain and sorrow, my heart was cracked open. All right. The truth of the matter is, is this, is that I kind of guess I always, and I've shared this before, thought of, I always wanted to kind of be tough. You know, because that's what my dad was real tough. And he taught me that that's what a man was supposed to be, was real tough. And, 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 you know, but at that moment in time, all toughness went out the window. I have to be perfectly honest with you. It, you know, it, it, I was in a state of brokenness. My heart was broken. And in that state of brokenness, I knew that I needed God. I knew that nothing else was going to work. I was able to see what a mess I was. And how bad I needed God. And I told him that. I in that state of brokenness, I said, God, I need you. I need your help. And, and when I told him that, I told him that I knew my heart was wrong and that I needed him to make me right, to help me to go in the right direction. And that's a similar thought to the message that we just read out of Amos. Because in this passage of scripture that we read in Amos, what I want you to know is that Amos wasn't even really a prophet before that time. The, the Bible teaches, if you read the whole book of Amos, that he was actually a, a sheep breeder. The, the, at least the word in the Hebrew is the idea that he bred sheep. But in addition to that, he was a fig farmer, not a pig farmer, a fig farmer. And so he's a fig farmer and he was a shepherd, but he also bred sheep. And all of a sudden, the word of the Lord came to Amos. It was a time whenever God wanted his people to hear the word of God and he broke through and he gave, he made somebody who typically wasn't a mouthpiece for him to be a mouthpiece for him and he spoke to them. You see, God's people had been in rebellion for at least 300 years at this point. This is after King David. This is after Solomon had taken over. This is after Solomon had failed. God and the kingdom had been split. And for 300 years now, the people had been really embracing the ways of the world, the people of the world, and had been in rebellion against God. You know, the truth is, is that usually whenever God's people go in an opposite direction, it doesn't start off real obvious. That's right. You know what I'm saying? It's like little things. It starts off with little things that begin to influence us and slowly and surely begin to pull us away from the Lord. And, and the Lord was wanted to, to let them know he's the whole time he's, he's, he's calling on them through the different prophets to come back and, and to listen to him. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in a place in your life, for me personally, where you were, you were in a place where you shouldn't have been, a place of rebellion and disobedience, God will send someone your way. And many times it's an unlikely person. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Like it was unlikely for God to speak through Amos. He was a sheep breeder. He was a fig farmer. But all of a sudden the word of the Lord came. And he said, <laughs> and the warning that was given is that because of repeated disobedience time and again without re without with a refusal with a refusal to bow the knee to God and to go God's way there's a danger that takes place Amen. a danger that takes place where a famine can take place where you desire the word of God you desire the will of God you desire to hear the voice of God in the direction of God but yet there's a famine and you can't hear it like you want to hear it have you ever been there before yes. I think that we all as Christians go through seasons in our life, right? 
where we feel as though we've heard the voice of the God more clearly than at other times in our life. So this isn't a message of condemnation. We've all been there. And if we haven't, if we're not there right now, there's a good chance that we may be there again at some point in time, even sometimes when we're not in disobedience. God holds back because there's a time of testing where we don't, where we're not able to hear his voice, where we're seeking his face, but we don't get the direction that we're looking for. And, and it doesn't come to us as clearly. So there's a danger in this repeated disobedience, a danger in our own lives where we may not be able to hear his voice, but it's never God's desire to leave us there. Amen. Yeah. It's never God. Even in this book of, of Amos, the, the book ends with hope because God always wants his people to know that there's always hope. Amen. And it's never God's desire, once again, that his people stay in famine unless he, it, 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 actually what happens is, is that God allows famine for a purpose. He allows famine for a purpose to bring us to a place that will begin to change our hearts and towards desiring what he has for us. The truth is, is that our hearts are on the inside of who we are. We have our own desires many times. And, and sometimes the desires of our heart are really in general, in a general way, are not a bad thing. Because sometimes they're desires that God has given to people. But many times those desires that we have in our heart are overwhelmingly more important to us than God's will for our lives. Mm -hmm. And whenever that happens, now everything's off focus. And when that happens, we're not putting God first as the focal point. And when that happens, it's our desires that we're running after. And we're not pleased with the desires of God. We, in other words, our heart isn't longing to desire the things of God. God doesn't want us to stay in famine. Take a look at Jeremiah 29 verses 11 <laughs> through 13. This is a... Uh, Similar time frame uh, as what Amos is, you know, maybe a little bit later, but the same concept. Now the people of God really are in captivity because they really didn't listen. But once again, God doesn't plan to keep them there. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. You see, right now they're in the midst of a situation. In the book of Jeremiah, they are repeated disobedience has led them to a place of famine. Literally, they're a captive and they're, they're in a place where they don't want to be. But God brings a word through the prophet Jeremiah. And, you know, he has to he has to tell Jeremiah in the beginning of the book. He says, when you speak to my people, don't look at their faces. Don't be confounded by them. In other words, they're not they're going to their face is going to make they're, they're not going to look like they want to hear what you have to say. But you do what I've called you to do. I'll put my word in your mouth and you speak it. And what, this is a good word of hope, even in the midst of a bad time. That God says, uh, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, the thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God has an expected end for his people. He says to give you an expected end. Another way that some translations say it, to give you a future and a hope. He says, then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me. When will you seek me and find me? When you shall search for me with all your heart. God allows famine to take place. God allows frustration to take place. God allows painful times and circumstances to take place for a bigger purpose. In this passage, God is telling Jeremiah to tell his people that, listen, You've been going after the world around you. You've been embracing the things that the world wants to offer you. But his response is this. I have a future for you. I have a hope for you. And this is when you're going to find it. Number one, they're going to have to come to the end of themselves. Yes. The whole concept of them seeking God with all of their heart means that they've come to the end of themselves. Mm -hmm. Truth be told... Many times we don't want to come to the end of ourselves. Can I get an amen? Yeah, amen. I mean, I know that, listen, I know that the preaching's better than what you're amen in because every last one of us know for a fact that many times we don't want to come to the end of ourselves in a lot of ways and circumstances in our life. 
We want to hold on. The Lord said, when they come to the end of themselves, then, see, until you come to the end of yourself, you won't seek and search for him with all of your heart. Right. Isn't it not a sad thing that many times I'm preaching to the preacher, we hold on to little pieces of ourself in our heart. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so it's the same for everyone. Once they come to the end of themselves and what they want, they will seek God with all their heart and start to desire what he wants. And that's really what I wanted to talk to you about this morning. The desires of our heart in going after God. But when they seek him with all their heart, then is when he will be found. And that brings me to my first point, really, is that he wants our heart. Amen. He wants our heart. And, you know, in the New Testament, the word heart and the word for soul, they're not the same, but the idea is many times the same. The word for heart is really cardia. In the Greek, I don't mean to get all technical on you, but that's where we get the word cardiac. <coughs> but whenever the New Testament is talking about the heart and it uses the word cardia, it's not talking about the muscle in the left side of your chest that pumps blood throughout your body and oxygenates your cells. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about that part of the inner man. When the word soul is used, it's often the word suke, which is it's spelled like psyche, P-S-U-C-H-E, where we get the word psyche from. So what I'm trying to make, the point that I'm trying to make is that the word heart and soul are used in a way synonymously. And what they're describing is who we are as individuals. It's what makes Irving, Irving, Matt, Matt, Beth, Beth, Vince, Vince. It's we're different and we're individuals. Many people would tell you, and, and I definitely believe that it's true. I'm not trying to get psychological on you, but I'm trying to tell you that people have studied the human mind. And there is a, I don't believe that psychology can fix us. We need Jesus to fix Amen. us. But what I will tell you is this, is that I do believe that the soul is made up or, or contains our mind, what we think and what we know, our will, what we want and what we desire, even the direction that we go. And our emotions, hate, love, anger, sadness. It's, it's our makeup. Does that make sense? And this might be getting kind of deep, but, but at the same time, I want you to try to, try to stay with me. I'll try, I'm going to try to explain what I'm trying to say. Our mind thinks and has desires and makes decisions that produce memories. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about your history. I'm talking about your life, where you've been, what you've gone through, the decisions you've made. And the decisions that you've made that have caused an indelible impression to be a picture in your mind, a memory. And those memories many times affect you. And, and, and these memories and these choices that we make cause an emotional stir on the inside of us. We're emotional creatures. Right. And whether it be hate or love or anger or sadness... All of these things, right, have an impression on our heart, it's, and it's who we are. And it helps to formulate the way we think. It helps to formulate the world that we live in. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Each and every one of us have experienced. See, our will causes us to make choices. Your individual will will sometimes cause you to make choices because there's a conflict between who you are and who God wants you to be. And you have your own desires and you go towards those desires and you grab a hold of them. And now, because of that, it causes an emotional disturbance or an, a good emotion. But we should never be ruled by our emotions. That's right. Right? Amen. <clears throat> we often allow the desires of our soul to control us. The mind, the will, and the emotions of God's people. Who or what? Has your love and devotion? Is it God or something else? What has control of your mind? 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know, when I first was saved and first was trying to learn the Bible, I think that people many times would kind of look at this scripture the wrong way. 
I mean, we can get so off focus from the word of God. Like the, w- the way that this was presented to me was, okay, you got a problem in your thought life. Well, you need to learn this scripture right here and you need to quote this scripture. And I'm not coming against quoting scripture, but you know what happens is that I love quoting scripture. But what happens is, is that before, and I didn't, this wasn't really part of my message, but I'm going to make it part real quick. What happens is, is we start putting our faith in the quoting of scripture in order to gain victory. And you could quote scripture all day long and you might get a little bit of a moment of relief right then and there. But the truth of the matter is, in order to have freedom in your thought life and in your mind, you need to understand and keep your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. And you need the work of the Holy Spirit moving and operating in your life to bring victory in your thought life. But what the, the reason I brought this up was is because there are imaginations that take place in our mind that are contrary to the word of God. Right. There are things that go on, on this, in this world that are contrary to the knowledge of God that he right. has given us. That's why it's so important that we learn the word of God. Right. Because if you don't understand the word of God in its context, I'm not talking about just being able to quote some scripture. Listen, I love the fact that my girls went to Christian school. Part of the reason I, I mean, I got pluses and minuses about it. I mean, there's a part to me that feels like you would hope that kids would be able to live for the Lord in in a worldly environment. But Lord knows I've had a hard time living sometimes for the Lord in a a worldly environment. But they did. they, They learned a lot of Bible. There was a time when I remember the girls, they probably could still do it for you now. They learned it in a song about love, uh, the, the love chapter in, in Corinthians 13, where they could sing out that whole chapter to you and because of the way, because they memorize these things. But just because you memorize a bunch of scripture doesn't really mean that you understand the context and the knowledge of the word of God. Right. Amen. And there are things in this world and there are ways that the enemy is trying to pull God's people away that are against the knowledge of God. God's given us knowledge in his word. He's given us knowledge of who he is, how he is, what he loves, what he hates. And there's so many things that try to pull us away from that knowledge and try to grab a hold of the desires of our heart to pull them away from him. And his desires. This world and the enemy of our soul wants to take control of our mind and move us any way he can away from the thoughts and the will and the desires of God. And when it comes to our emotions, sometimes the desires of our heart that are contrary to God's word controls us. Controls us through our emotions. We should never be controlled by our emotions. We should never let fear, anger, sadness, or even love control us and steer us in a direction opposite of God and the will that he has for our lives. But you know that we're all emotional. Some people are more emotional than others. Some people, you couldn't get an emotion out of them if you pricked them with a pin. They said, they so, they, you can pop them with a pin and they still like just sit there. And, you, know, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to be funny. I, maybe it wasn't that funny. But my point is, is that some people aren't really all that emotional. And some of us are hyper emotional. Right? Point number two is we need a transplant. We need a heart transplant. God wants our heart, but we need a heart transplant. And that's what the new covenant does. It gives us a transplant. Amen. King David cried out for it after his sin with Bathsheba. Amen. Look at Psalm 51 verse 10 real quick. This is what King David said. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Basically, he's asking God to do a creative miracle on the inside of his life. David knows that he needs God to do something that he can't do. You can't change your own heart. I can't change my own heart. God, hallelujah, can change the heart. Amen. And God promised to do that for us in the new covenant. Look at Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. I know I use this this scripture a lot, but I I love to see in the Old Testament promises about the New Testament. And so this is somewhere around B.C. 600, something like that. And God speaks through Ezekiel and he tells him of a day that's coming where there's going to be a change that takes place. He says, then talking about in that day in the future, will I sprinkle clean water upon you now? 
real quick, I just want to make the point, and I know I've shared this with you before, so please don't get bored with me. But this water wasn't just regular water. Blood in it. That's right. It had blood in it. That's right. Where did the blood come from? Because they burned the whole red heifer, blood and all. And they took the ashes from it, and they put it in the water. You see what I'm saying? The point that I'm trying to make with that is this. Throughout the whole Bible, the plan of God has always been going to, it was always going to be fulfilled by Jesus coming to the earth and dying on the cross you, and bearing our sin upon him and in turn giving us his righteousness so that the grace of God could operate in our life, change the desires of our heart and give us a heart that was hungry for his ways and his will. And what this passage is telling us, this is a type of the cleansing of Calvary. I will sprinkle clean water, and let me just inject this, that has blood in it upon you. And you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit, a heart <laughs> transplant. God in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, 600 years before Jesus ever came, promised that there would be a New Covenant and in it there would be a change, a heart transplant would take place. I will put it within you and I will take away the stony heart, that old heart that you were born with in your physical birth that was hard and resistant to the ways of God. I'm going to take that out and I'm going to give you, he goes on to say, a heart of flesh. You know, a heart of flesh is soft and it's pliable and God can mold it and work with it. He says, and I'm going to put my spirit within you. That's the new covenant right there. That's what I started this message off and it wasn't even my notes. I say it a lot, but the fact that makes us different than the world around us is the fact that when we're converted, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of our hearts and it becomes, we become one with God. And he says, I'm going to put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And, you know, I just wanted to say real quick, and I know that many of you already know these answers, but just to be reminded, how is this new heart given? Let's look at Romans chapter five, verse 12. I know I draw I used to draw it on the board all the time and I don't draw it too much anymore, but I'm going to draw it today. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all for that all have sinned. Who's that talking about when it says, by one man, sin entered the world? Adam. It's talking about Adam. And then it's, what does it say about that sin of Adam? It spread to all men. In your first birth, in your physical birth, you were born in Adam. That's what the Bible teaches. It teaches in your first birth, you were born in Adam. You are what, I don't know if you ever watched that show and I wasn't really all that crazy about it, but the Chronicles of Narnia. I thought that that was interesting whenever I watched it in one of the first scenes of the show, they said, oh, you're one, whenever she crossed over that little girl, I think her name was Lucy. When she crossed over into that the, that Narnia world, what happened was is that she said that they were they were sons of Adam. Okay, we're we're, we're sons of Adam in our first birth. We're born like Adam. We're born with sin. Sin has spread throughout the entirety of the human race. That equates to the sinful nature, right? But look at this in Colossians chapter two, verses eleven through thirteen. It says in that passage of scripture, in whom you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now, I want to I just kind of like take a moment to say this. In the Old Testament, we know that circumcision was a sign of God's covenant with his people. It was the cutting away of flesh and that was seen as unclean by God. And through that process, blood was shed. In the New Testament, when it talks about a circumcision, look what it's saying. It's saying that you were circumcised with a circumcision that was done without hands. We're not talking about a physical circumcision here. We're talking about a change to the man that was born of Adam. Something that happens because it's a new birth. 
There's a new birth that takes place when you hear the gospel and put your faith in what Christ has done and you are converted from a sinner to a saint and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. If you could look at it that way in the spiritual realm, God does a spiritual circumcision and he removes that part of you or he does away with in the spirit that part that you received in Adam. He says, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened and given you life together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Listen, when you put faith in Christ, God puts you in him. Right. Amen. Amen. And whenever, according to this scripture, in baptism, now I'm going to tell you, I do not believe that this scripture is talking about water baptism because water baptism does not transform a life. That's right. Right. Water baptism is an outward sign of what's taking place spiritually. The word baptism in the Greek, we've talked about this a lot in the book of Romans. The word water is not there. What you need to understand is this real quick, is that whenever the scripture talks about baptism, it talks about taking someone from one place and putting them into another place. You were just like a person is overwhelmed in water when they're baptized in water. You were overwhelmed in Christ when you put faith in him. The Holy Spirit took you. Your old man just is a type. Your old man going down into the water, dying and being buried and a new man coming back to resurrection of life. But when on the day that you put faith in Christ. If you really have put faith in Christ, that's what happened to you. The Holy Spirit took you and put you in Jesus. And in the mind of God, you were baptized from your old life into Christ. And you partook with him in his death and his burial. And even as he was raised from the dead, you too also should walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. The old man born of Adam was born dead in sin, but the new man born again is born again in Christ. And he's given a new life and he's given new hope. And with that new life and new hope, there's supposed to be a change to the desires of the heart because there's a new heart that's been given. Now, I wish that the desires of the heart were changed all the time. You know, or, or that fast. I wish that the desires of the heart were changed as rapidly as what the heart really is changed in the mind of God. Amen. It, it, it doesn't tend to happen that way. It's a process of time. God, once again, many times has to convince us in our own heart and mind that we do want him and that we don't want our old ways. Right. So the new man born again into the new covenant is given a new heart that has new desires. Let's look at Matthew chapter. I'm sorry, not Matthew. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. This, I, I, I love this. I, I just happen to look up this word observe right here in the Hebrew. And I mean, it was just, it was a beautiful thing whenever I saw that. He says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my way. Hallelujah. And you know what the word observe means right there? Take pleasure. Let your eyes take pleasure in my ways. That's a, that's a beautiful thought. We need the Lord to do a work in that's our right. heart. Listen to me. If the desires of your heart are not for the ways and you're not taking pleasure in the ways of the Lord, then there's something wrong with the heart. I'm preaching to the preacher right now. If we have desires in our heart that are for something that is contrary to the word and the knowledge of God, it's a vain imagination that needs to be cast down. Just like if you'll remember the story of Gideon. You remember that story, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever the Lord got a hold of Gideon, they were in bondage to the Midianites and the angel of the Lord showed up. And what happened? Gideon wanted to give his heart to the Lord. He said, you know what? It's time for me to sell out. And what did God say? Okay, you want to sell out to me? You got business to take care of. Your daddy's got an idol that needs to be cast down. Remember that? He, 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 took that, he took one of those oxen that he had and he slaughtered that thing. And he took that, 
he took that Asherah pole, which was an idol that his dad had. His dad wasn't supposed to have that idol. He cast that idol down and used it as wood to burn that altar, to burn that sacrifice to the Lord. Gideon cast down that idol. And, and just in a similar fashion, God is asking us to cast down those vain imaginations that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. <clears throat> Let's look at this. See, with a new, this is point number three, actually, because he said, my son, give me your heart and take pleasure in my ways. And point number three says that with new desires, there comes a new direction. Let's look at Proverbs chapter three, verses five through eight. With new desires, there comes a new direction. See, where your heart goes, <coughs> and that's what, that's what the Lord said earlier on. He said, he, said where, he talked about the treasure of the heart. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart is. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. I love the thought of marrow, you know. I can remember whenever the Lord first got a hold of me, that's what the word I would use. It's like he did something to the marrow in my bones. Because, I mean, I understand some of that stuff just because I, I know a little bit about medicine. But the marrow is where red blood cells are generated from. Red blood cells carry hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen. Oxygen is deposited in the cell and gives life. Hallelujah. When God get, does something to the marrow of your bones, he gives you life. Amen. New life. New heart. New desires. He changes things on the, on the inside of you. Amen. There's so many times that we know right from wrong, but we look at our circumstances and we feel hopeless. Have you ever been there? I know right from wrong, but I look at my circumstances, I look at my situation, and it feels hopeless. It's like, how in the world, Lord, could you ever fix this? <laughs> I understand the battle, but what's the navel? I don't understand. Well, I mean, it, I, the navel is probably, I mean, if I had to guess, I'm kind of shooting from the hip here because it didn't go back. It's where the um, umbilical cord is, and it's where a child is, is, receives nutrition. And, you know, certainly there's a truth in the sense that just as a child receives nutrition from its mother while it's in utero, we dependent upon the Lord receive nutrition from the Amen. Lord. Amen. His grace flows through Calvary. There's a connection to God through Calvary, a connection to God through our old life dying and our new man being resurrected. Amen. <coughs> As a matter of fact, I used to draw a little umbilical cord right here. <laughs> yeah, I just got to make sure you draw it in the right place. But it's an umbilical cord of grace. <laughs> there you go. Where the Lord strengthens and gives us spiritual nutrition. Amen? We don't see, but you know what I was trying to say is, is that we don't see how in the world God could ever fix the situation that we're in, the circumstances. And because we feel hopeless, we begin to lean on our own understanding. Yeah. He says, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your path. The question is, will we trust him? To direct our path. Will we trust him that he will get us to the place where we really want to be in the end? Or do we think we know where we want to be? And we're going to continue to travel in that direction. Don't be wise in our own eyes and attempt to figure it out. Trust God. Fear God. Don't fear your situation. Fear God. Because God changes situations. Amen? Amen? Let's look at Psalm 145 verse 19. You know, the word fear, and I'm sure you already know that. I know that a lot of people in here study the Bible. Yes, there's, there's a healthy fear. Uh, there, there's a healthy fear that whenever we go the wrong way, that God will chastise those whom he loves. But at the same time, the idea of fear really connects itself to reverence. That we, we have a reverence for God. That we're concerned about the Lord. That we're concerned about his heart. That we're concerned about his will. Amen. He says he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. 
You know, whenever you come to a place in your life where you reverence God and your heart is connected to Him, your desires are really taking on His desires. That's why whenever you fear the Lord, He's able to give you the desires of your heart because now your desires begin to line up with His desires. He also will hear their cry and will save them. When the heart is changed and the desires are changed, there's a healthy fear of the Lord. The new heart wants to live for God. The new heart loves the word of God. The new heart wants to be part of the community of God. Amen? I mean, I was kind of messing with somebody this morning. They were like, well, you don't ever have to miss church. You can always just have church in your in your living room with the Bible. And I kind of get messed with them a little bit. And I understood what the what the person was saying. OK, they said, well, I was just trying to say that even if you miss church, you can still have church. And that is true. It's you and the Lord with the word of God. But there's but at the same time, God has called his people to gather together. That's right. And, and, and God has called. He said that the word of God says forsake not the gathering of the brethren. There is a community of the people of God. The word it's a community is kind of like communion in the sense that it's a common unity. We have a common unity one with another, and it's the fact that Jesus shed his blood and died for us. We believed it, and when that happened, we all now have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. We have that in common with one another. Does that mean you're always going to like me and I'm always going to like you? No. Or, you know, what I'm trying to get at, that we'll never get on each other's nerves. That's not true. <laughs> because the truth is, is that a church is like a family. And I don't know about you. But I've had trouble with people in my family before. <laughs> Amen. Not, of course, not with my mom. My mom is just the sweetest person you ever met. But that's not true. Me and mom have had our issues too, <coughs> right? Family people, we got issues with our family, and you're gonna have issues with the family of the people of God. That's right. And one of the worst things that you can do. Now, listen, I'm not trying to tell you that God does not call people to go to another church. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I will tell you is this. More oftentimes, people leave a church and go to another church because of their flesh and the desires of their own heart than God's will. And one of the worst things that you can do is get up and uproot yourself because you don't like the way somebody has acted. Or can, can I give you a news flash? There's a lot of times Christians don't act right. <laughs> don't do the right thing. And if you leave a church every time somebody says something to you that you don't like or does something to you that you don't like, you ain't never going to be rooted and grounded. You're just going to get up and walk out and find a new church every week. Or you'll get to the point where you just end up watching church on television. Now nobody can offend. I'm not saying that it's a problem if you miss. I'd rather you turn on the television and watch church than turn on the saints. At least you paid attention. You got something uh, about the word of God in you. Amen. 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 Especially if they lose to Cleveland today. You're really be sad. Oh uh, yeah, but that's a whole other story. But what I'm trying to say is, is that. There should be a hunger and a desire for the things of God, yeah. for the community of God, for the people of God to understand. You can't. What I'm trying to tell you is it's safe to try to say you serve God in your living room, yeah. Yeah. especially if you got a cantankerous spirit. <laughs> what I mean is, is that if you got a personality that can't get along with nobody, it's real easy to live for God in your living room. Yeah. Because now you ain't got nobody messing with you <coughs> and doing stuff that you don't like the way things are done. But when you come to the house of God, if, especially if you hang around long enough, somebody's going to do something that's going to irritate you. Well, guess what? When somebody irritates you, you can learn how to bring it to the Lord. And ask God, sometimes God will allow certain people in your life, this isn't even in my message, but sometimes God will allow certain things to take place in our life to show us things in our own life. That's right. Amen. 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 The reality is that God, you know, when we come to a place with this new heart that has, and God wants us to have new desires, but so often the heart still desires the things of the world and those things pull God's people away. And many times we question, what is it that I can do to change? 
right? And many times the, in the past, the preacher would say, well, this is what you got to do. You got to do this, 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 and this. And give you like a formula where all the work was on you. And don't get me wrong. You need to read your Bible to have the knowledge of God. You need to pray to enter into the presence of God and receive the wisdom of God. But in order for your heart to be changed, it's going to be a work done by God. And so when you read the Bible and you learn the knowledge of God, part of the knowledge that you receive should let you know that you can't change your own heart. But that you need God to do it. And one of the prayers of your heart should be, like David, created me a clean heart, O oh Lord. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Amen. So the reality is that is this, is that God has to do the changing. And it's us that has to want him to change us. This is the last scripture right here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The last part is what I really wanted you to focus on. It is God which works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's the one that has to change the desires of the heart. He's the one that has to cause the will to desire his ways. Amen.